we're actually now uh, streaming live via Facebook, so we're ready to go. So welcome everybody who's uh, tuned in to today's special broadcast. I'm here with Julian Fedini from Property360. We're going to be talking about a topic which we've described as where to buy to recover your deposit in two years. And essentially what we mean by that is uh, where to buy in areas where you're going to get um, good long-term growth, certainly, but uh, in particular good uh, growth in, in the first two or three years of ownership such that you will recover what you have uh, uh, spent on your deposit to get into that property. We're going to uh, start by talking about uh, one or two recent examples where that has happened, and then Julian and I are going to speak about some of perhaps the future hotspots, the ones that we're identifying in both our businesses as the ones where we think you as investors might be focusing your attention as buyers seeking that kind of growth, the sort of growth where you can recover your deposit within two years. But firstly, um, I'd like to introduce Julian Fedini from Property 360. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and what you can do to assist property investors. Thanks, Terry. Uh, hi to everybody out there. Yeah, my name is uh, Julian Fedini. I've been in the property business for 20 years now. Um, our business helps clients with advice uh, around uh, property investment and making sure that people get the property investment and the acquisitions correct for their portfolio. Um, we're investors ourselves, and 90% of the time we're investing in the same areas that we're recommending for our clients. Okay, so just, just to kick off the, the general theme, Julian, I think it's fair to say that um, the coverage of real estate in me is very generalised. They talk about Australia as a single market and as a, an overwhelming focus on what's happening in the two biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, to the exclusion of all other places. And that means that we're really not hearing about um, some of the growth markets that exist around Australia and other places. We've been hearing a lot about what's happened in Sydney and Melbourne, the, the downturn and now the recovery. Um, but while Sydney and Melbourne have been perhaps um, going to reverse with prices correcting, falling, um, there's been a lack of recognition that in other parts of Australia, including in regional Australia, that there have been a lot of really strong growth markets. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've been finding that yourself with what you do, Julian. Yeah, absolutely, Terry, 100%. Um, if you're focused uh, purely on investment fundamentals and research, um, and obviously that's, that's what we rely on you for, Terry, if, if you focus on that, the money being made in the market over the last few years hasn't been in the capital cities. It's definitely been in the regional cities. I think one thing needs to be made clear to people is that regional cities aren't necessarily two horse towns or mining mining uh, mining areas and things like that. Um, these regional cities uh, that have been producing consistent and really strong growth have uh, a very strong story about the infrastructure that's changing the areas and the dollar value of that infrastructure shows that the area will be changing. Uh, basically forever. You cannot spend billions of dollars in infrastructure uh, and have the city remain the same. And so if we've been, part of our strategy has been tracking that infrastructure spend and that's been paying big dividends for ourselves and our, client, and our clients. And we've certainly been finding the same thing with what we do at Hot Sporting Julian. Now, we've um, seen that while Sydney's been going down, there's been many locations in regional New South Wales that have been rising strongly. Similarly, in Victoria, as Melbourne has been subsiding, um, many of the, the key regional cities and towns of regional Victoria have had strong growth markets. Many of them have grown double digits in the last one to two years. And um, I think we, we're also seeing growth markets also emerging now in regional Queensland. I'm going to talk about one of those a little bit later in the broadcast, but I thought um, Julian and I would begin by ha having a discussion about a market, a regional market, that has demonstrates the kind of things we want to talk about today, a regional market that's shown extremely strong growth in, say, the last three years. And that's uh, the city of Greater Geelong. Now, I know that um, this is a market that you have um, been involved in recently, Julian, with, with your business, and you, um, you know that market pretty well, so perhaps you could give us your thoughts on on the city of Greater Geelong and uh, what it's done and why it's been a growth market. 
Yeah, Geelong has so many strong uh, investment fundamentals um, at play. So uh, we have a progressive Victorian government down there that has made Geelong and some of the other regional cities uh, close to Melbourne. Part of their strategy to grow uh, or to, to have uh, the population growth that they're experiencing. Um, we've seen uh, government offices uh, change uh, from capital cities out to these regional centres, in particular Geelong. Um, significant amount of people have, have moved from Melbourne to Geelong for employment. Um, when it comes to uh, other investment infrastructure spending, like medical, uh, education and um, things like that, Geelong really is one of the places in Australia that has had a staggering amount of infrastructure being spent there, and there's still a staggering amount left. So um, the, the, what we found the key to our success in those areas um, was we were looking for unique pockets of, of residential homes where the demand is uh, specifically more driven by owner occupiers than it has been for investors. Um, and and by, by implementing that strategy, staying close to the surf beaches and around the Bellarine Peninsula, our clients have done extremely well when it comes to capital growth. Yeah, I think some of the points that you've just mentioned are very important. Things that um, investors generally should look for. You, you referred to the, the relocation of government departments from perhaps Melbourne, uh, central Melbourne to Geelong and we've also seen the uh, the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, set up its national headquarters in Geelong and what we've found there is that other businesses that are, are relevant to that particular service, they want to be close to that headquarters so it's actually brought an influx of, of new businesses into the central Geelong wanting to set up there and so the, the office market has improved, jobs have been created and of course that all has a major impact on the the broader property market for the city of Greater Geelong. Yeah, look, the thing that we really like about Geelong is you have to be careful with property markets that show signs of what I would call a sugar hit. Um, you know, you, you may get a boost uh, in the short term. However, there's nothing to carry that growth over the long term. Um, when you consider everything that you just mentioned about the government spending and the, and the relocation of jobs, etc., um, that pr provided us and our clients an early equity uplift, but we believe that the continuation of infrastructure spending in that area will, will carry those property markets along consistently. And generally, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an early uplift and, and evidence to show that we'll get continue continued capital growth from from the purchase date. So it's very much about, um, I guess, two different types of capital growth. Um, you want to be in areas that are going to be good for the long term because real estate investment essentially is a long term play, but you also want it to be a market. You want to be buying into a market at a point in the cycle where it's going to get that, that uplift in the first one, two, three years to create equity, um, which will assist um, investors to um, be able to actually grow their portfolios using the equity created. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the, one of the generally speaking, one investment property is not going to change your life dramatically. Um, so it's important to get the first property right, uh, and then uh, leverage off that property for future purchases. Um, in doing that, you need to be extremely thorough about the locations that you pick to make sure that you are being able to have that client purchase again in the time frame that we just discussed. Okay. Now, um, I've got a, a copy of uh, a Geelong report in front of me. I know you've got a copy there as well, Julian, and, and um, I'm just looking at some of the statistical data that's been produced by that market recently and it's a great illustration of what can be achieved if you choose your locations correctly if you buy in locations that uh, have a strong diverse growing economy growing population tick all the boxes infrastructure spending as you've mentioned a number of times julian and and that translates into strong demand in real estate so i think the first thing that stands out um, about the the chart of 
um, suburbs in Geelong is just the, the size of the turnover. With there, it's common throughout the, the city of Greater Geelong to have suburbs where there's 200, 250, 300, 350 sales in a single year. So very popular suburbs, lots of home buyers and investors buying in there. Um, and the second thing that stands out for me is that the long-term growth rates are particularly strong. Many of the suburbs have seven, eight, nine percent per year. That's the the growth average over 10 years. So if your your prices, you're owning real estate in a market where prices are growing at seven or eight percent or nine percent per year over 10 years, um, you're going to be doing very well as a property investor. Yeah, absolutely. So if we're referring to that report. Um, you know, assuming, and not a lot of investors use a 20% deposit, but assuming investors were using a 20% deposit, if investors refer to your uh, report for Geelong, um, you know, I'm looking at a suburb, for example, uh, we've got a, a purely on the data here. Um, Whittington, for example, has uh, 20% growth in one year. The statistical 10-year growth averages 7%. So if you buy any property and in over 10 years you can average 7%, you're going to be doing very well. Um, so, yeah, we, it, it just highlights the importance of having um, a thorough and uh, detailed research partner like yourself to make sure that we get these figures right for our clients. Yeah. And just to focus on a couple of suburbs um, in terms of the, the one year, three year, five year and 10 year averages, because to, to, it very much illustrates the points that you're making about firstly the long term growth rate, but also that short term growth rate. A couple of the, the more affordable suburbs in Geelong are Nor Lane and Corio, uh, perhaps in the, the sort of northern part of the city of Greater Geelong, closer to central Melbourne. Um, they both um, had exceptional growth in the last one year, three year and five year, uh, but still very affordable with median prices in the mid 300,000s. Um, Nor Lane, for example, in the past year, it's grown 15%, but over the past three years, its median price has increased 62% and over five years, 72%. So if you're buying a location and three years later, um, property values are 60% higher than, than when you bought three years ago, you're going to be a very, very happy investor and you will have created a substantial amount of equity which can help you to, to make the next property play. And that's pretty much what you're looking for for your investor clients, I think, Julian. Yeah, exactly. What's super important is to understand the data. So, for example, um, investors really need to take note to the median house price um, within the area that they're investing in. Um, you never want to be too uh, far away, either on the lower side or the higher side than the median house price, um, because that's exactly how the data is calculated. So then not only do you need to understand that figure, you also need to understand what type of property is considered a median property for that area. Um, so we do a lot of on the ground research by um, traveling to these areas, meeting with the most successful and dominant agents in the area, both uh, sales agents as well as property managers, to make sure that we really get a good understanding of the type of property that's going to fit in that median house price to make sure that our clients get that, those, that growth, that double-digit growth. Okay. So Geelong is very much a, a great example of uh, the sorts of locations that um, investors should be trying to target, affordable, Entry prices, good rental yields, um, good prospects for long-term growth, and then you're buying at the right time of the cycle. For example, if you'd bought in Geelong, say, two years ago, you'd be getting that early uplift and creating equity very quickly. Um, so, and of course, it's um, a key regional city in Victoria, and it emphasises the point, or one illustration of the point that we're making, that um, many of the, the best opportunities the last few years and certainly currently are to be found in um, regional Australia. Um, it seems to me, Julian, that your uh, screen may have frozen. I'm not, I'm not seeing you at the moment. I, you seem to have frozen. Is the what are you seeing at your end? Uh, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at some frozen pictures here of both you and I, uh, Terry. Yeah. yeah. 
So it, it's operating normally at our end. Uh, we're, we're in South East Queensland, Julian's in Sydney. Um, so I'm, I'm just not sure um, what, what, um, what you can do. Um, Katie, yeah, I'm, I'm just working on some stuff now, Terry. Yeah. Um, can put that back up. So some of the people who are actually watching are saying that they've got no issues at streaming okay to Facebook, etc. So maybe it's um, something we just need to ignore and, and just continue on, Julian. Um, sure. We've talked about the city of Greater Geelong as a great example of um, what you can achieve if you find the right locations. Um, and now I'm going to turn our t attention to discussing some of the markets um, out there in regional Australia where we think that there's going to be similar kinds of growth um, that's similar to what's been achieved in the city of Greater Geelong over the, the past two to three years. And the first one we wanted to focus on is um, the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And Julian, I know that's a, a market that you've taken an interest in, but what particularly about the Sunshine Coast has attracted your interest? So Sunshine Coast for us was a, a location that we invested heavily in in 2015. Um, another key uh, part of Sunshine Growth appeal um, and, the, and its ability to get results was the amount of infrastructure spend in that area as well. Um, uh, in, in comparison to Geelong, the infrastructure spending in, in Sunshine Coast is much higher. Um, the lifestyle in the Sunshine Coast is probably one of the best in Australia. Uh, they have they have amazing beaches. Um, transport is is reasonable, um, and so housing is affordable. the The missing part for the Sunshine Coast was the ability to get a job, so that you could obviously support your family. That's all changed. Infrastructure wise, they're building a brand new CBD uh, in the Sunshine Coast in Maroochydore. The airport is um, being expanded, uh, or continually being expanded, really. Um, and uh, on top of that, uh, what we've seen is people that are looking for a, a good quality of life. So in 2015, uh, we invested around the Maruchidor CBD. Our clients were rewarded within that 12 to 15 months with, with their deposits being um, with the growth being equal to the deposits being paid. Again, assuming a 20% deposit. Okay. Uh, so, Julian, there are a few more messages coming through that um, that your screen is frozen. My, mine's moving, and they can see me, but um, yours isn't um, sort of coming in when you're speaking as it should be. So um, I'm just not sure what's happening with the video there at your end. Um, not sure what you can do about that, but I'll, I'll just continue to, uh, in the meantime, to talk about the Sunshine Coast. It's a market that um, not only is very close to where we are geographically, but one that we've um, researched a lot, and we've done quite a few reports on this this market because it is, as we said, one of the most compelling growth economies anywhere in Australia. And out of that has become a very strong property market. Julian's mentioned some of the infrastructure that's. Um, been very, very pivotal in making it so for the Sunshine Coast. Uh, the new CBD, 53 hectares, um, creating a, a CBD in the central part of the Sunshine Coast. It's from the ground up, um, probably unique in the history of Australia that that's happened. Cities uh, very seldom have that opportunity. Uh, the Sunshine Coast has um, got 53 hectares, which is now actually starting to be built. The first buildings are now starting construction. That will be a project that extends over 10, 15, 20 years. Um, one of many things um, adding up to investment uh, totaling more than $20 billion um, in a, a regional city of about 350,000 people. Um, part of that has been the creation of a whole new medical precinct on the Sunshine Coast, um, $5 billion work in project, um, work in progress, um, a major component the $2 billion university hospital is up and running and bringing lots of new people into the Sunshine Coast to live and work, many of them well-paid people, and that's given a substantial boost uh, to the property market, particularly the top end of the property market on the Sunshine Coast. Um, is that what you've been finding, Julian, um, with uh, your research on the Sunshine Coast?
Are you there, Julian? Okay, you you okay. reappeared, Julian. Yep. Sorry, yes, you 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 made a miraculous return. Thank God. Yep. I've just been uh, continuing to, to chat about the Sunshine Coast and noting that um, um, pieces of infrastructure like the the new two billion dollar university hospital has brought a lot of new people to the Sunshine Coast to live and work, and. Um, that many of them are well-paid people, and that's given the top end of the, the Sunshine Coast market, such as Noosa, a substantial boost. Um, is that what you've been finding with your research? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've, you know, Noosa definitely is in, in the in the price range for every investor. Um, however, what we've found, if you look at the data at the time, Noosa was a bit of a volatile market, but the huge change there is how much. Inf if, like we mentioned, the infrastructure spending is bringing um, jobs to the area. Those are high-paying jobs. So Noosa's, and Noosa and the whole Sunshine Coast is a transforming economy. Um, and what we're seeing from that is, uh, even through our own client base, a lot of people are taking up jobs in the Sunshine Coast. They're moving their family up there. Um, they're reporting that they're having a great uh, quality of life there. Uh, very unlikely to move back to Sydney, and all of these types of people are on uh, are on good incomes, which means that they can support the purchase prices that are in Noosa. Um, however, that Noosa is one of the most expensive locations in the Sunshine Coast, um, and Sunshine Beach and Sunrise Sun, Sunrise Beach also quite expensive parts of the market, and they are continuing to break. Uh, records with the with the prices that they've been achieving in those areas. So what we see from there is a trickle down effect um, to the to the the parts of the uh, property market that our investors find affordable. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're certainly finding the same thing. We we think the Sunshine Coast right now is the the strongest market anywhere in Queensland. There are parts of the Brisbane market that are doing quite well. Um, and there are other parts of regional Queensland that are starting to perform, like Mackay, for example. But the Sunshine Coast, uh, for the last one to two years, and still now, we think undoubtedly the strongest market in Queensland. And it's really a, about what's happening with the economy and that big infrastructure spend. It's so pivotal, isn't it, Julian? When you're spending that amount on infrastructure, the real estate market can't help but rise. Exactly right. However, I want to make uh, a very important point that you need to really understand the Sunshine Coast market. As you move um, south uh, from Maroochydore down towards Caloundra and to the northern parts of Brisbane, there is a lot of land there that is uh, that will be developed over time. Uh, and investors just need to be very careful and make sure that they understand that that much supply of land will generally have a downward um, effect on, on property prices. So when it comes to investing in the Sunshine Coast, you still need to be extremely careful. Not every location is a winner. Um, and, and yeah, you need to be thoroughly informed about uh, the places that will give you that return over that, 20, as part of the webinar, like we say, over that um, you know, uh, two year period of time. There's a, a very important point to make, Julian. That um, uh, certainly in the first instance, you want to perhaps identify a broad location that um, ticks all the boxes uh, in terms of being a, a place for prospective good growth in the short term and the long term. But then you need to drill down um, to the street level and find the absolute best location within it. It's not a case of buying anything anywhere in that location is going to give you good growth. You really need to make the effort to, to find the best locations, the best properties, um, tick all the boxes in terms of proximity to the important things like schools, public transport, uh, shopping, etc. 100%, 100%. Definitely, uh, when it comes to real estate supply and demand, uh, the, the, the shorter the supply of land, the more likely we're going to get that, um, that equity uplift. So yeah, definitely places to be very careful of on the Sunshine Coast. Yeah. One of the things to, to look at, and you know, you, you're talking about the um, the prospect that um, 
a good growth area can be um, damaged in terms of its property market by um, big supply of land, oversupply of new dwellings. Um, so it's very important to keep an eye on vacancy rates um, and also building approval figures. So um, I'm just looking at the vacancy rates charts for the Sunshine Coast, um, the various postcodes that cover that region in Queensland. And um, many of them have vacancy rates uh, that start with a one, in other words, below 2% which means um, pretty tight rental market. Um, the, the highest is 2.6%. Anything below 3% would tend to indicate a fairly healthy uh, rental market, um, but many of them are around 2% or lower, uh, which means that uh, rental demand and pressure on rentals is gonna be very positive from the viewpoint of property investors. We've never invested in a location with a vacancy rate above 3%. Um, the, the numbers that we're looking for, we just don't see the need to go to an area where the vacancy rates are above 3%. Um, uh, anywhere, anywhere between 3 and 2% is fantastic. Anywhere below 2%, uh, that's an extremely hot market. There's a lot of demand for rentals in, in, in that particular market. It also is one of the key indicators to make sure you're investing in the right, in the right location. Yeah. Um, so vacancy rates are a huge part of, of what we do. And then, and then you're very right in what you're saying, Terry. You must also look at the building approvals because the vacancy rates can change quite dramatically if there's a lot of land being developed and then bringing new supply to the market. Now tell me what you think of this, Julian. Um, I'm often um, disappointed by media's obsession with like medium price movements are pretty much the only barometer of real estate markets. And they tend to overlook what I think are very important markers of places that people should be considering. Vacancy rates is one, and then what's happening with rentals is another, because what, what I tend to find is that before a market starts to rise in price, we could often see action at the rental level. Vacancies come down, rents start to rise, and out of that comes demand for real estate. And prices sometimes, very often, follow rental. So it's a very good marker of a place that people should be considering, I think. I support that, uh, I support that comment 100%. Um, I think what I've noticed from you, Terry, in your reporting also, is that you focus on sales volumes. So yep. sales volumes, um, yeah, I guess the point to make to investors is you need to understand the key markets. You can't rely on any one of those key markets. There needs to be a more thorough, in, in order to get your deposit back within that two year period, you need to be thoroughly understanding all of those key markets. And then again, without getting down to the ground level, um, you know, and meeting the market face to face with the sales agents and also the property managers, um, you could be heading. Uh, you, you could be heading in the wrong direction, um, and that's what we've found. That, that, that the key part to our success is understanding all those fundamentals, checking them all out, and then still getting down on the ground level and being face to face with the market. Okay, look. Um we might switch attention to another location now, but just before I do, just to remind people who are out there watching and listening that um, we'd like to, to get your questions for the, the latter part of the broadcast. You can key your questions into either the Q&A panel or the, uh, the chat box that you should see in front of you. You can just type in your questions and in the last, say, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Um, so let's... Um, have a chat about another part of regional Australia, Julian. I, I know that you uh, are taking an interest in um, Tweed Shire, right up in the north near the, the border with Queensland, um, close to the Gold Coast. Markets like Kingscliff have grabbed your attention. What, what's happening there that's piqued your interest? Statistically speaking and looking at the numbers there, it's a ph ph phenomenal set of figures. Um, the The... The key part of what's going on, or what, what I believe one of the key parts of going on in that Tweed Coast and northern New South Wales area is that, again, it's a lifestyle, uh, it's a lifestyle location. Housing is still relatively affordable in comparison to the capital cities, but the quality of life in these locations is far better than life in a capital city. Um, what we're finding is inf infrastructure spending, hospitals and things like that, we're getting close to the billion dollars worth of infrastructure in those areas. 
median house prices in areas like uh, Byron Bay, um, which, which are still reasonably close, are three and three and four times more expensive than the areas surrounding um, the, the areas surrounding Byron Bay, and the demand by local people, um, homeowners, and the rest of it, that demand is what's attracting us there. Investor demand doesn't turn us on. We're not looking for that investor demand. The fact that the owner occupier market is so strong down there, that's what's driving us to that area, and then obviously the research that we've carried out. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, we um, have also noticed uh, an uplift in that market. You, you mentioned earlier that we chart uh, sales volumes. We think it's a very good marker of future price growth. And we've noticed an uplift in sales activity throughout that uh, Tweed Shire area. And um, I think some of the points you mentioned are, explain why that's happening. Um, it's not only is that area um, very affordable compared to the capital city, it's like it's um, Tweed, the suburbs of Tweed Shire are um, quite affordable compared to the Gold Coast, which is just over the invisible border. Um, so it's, it's a it's a good affordability comparison with the Gold Coast, similar lifestyle, similar attributes, perhaps less um, glitzy and congested and more affordable. The other uh, thing I think... Terry, you hit the, hit the nail on the head there. Uh, one of the things that, was, that came up a lot when we were doing our on-the-ground research there is where are these people, why is there this population boom, why, why is there so much demand in the market? Uh, and the interesting thing about Queenslanders and people that like to live by the beach is if an area becomes too popular, for example, uh, Burley Heads or the Gold Coast in that location, people uh, that, that uh, enjoy uh, a more relaxed, less congested lifestyle by the beach um, are heading to these areas. Yeah. And I think um, another factor for, for Tweed is, is its proximity to the the Gold Coast Airport um, is again across the 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 border that um, is just a line on a map, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but it's in the southern part of the Gold Coast area, and it's important, I think, to be close to that for accessibility reasons. But also, there's there's quite a precinct that's um, um, being built up around the airport, uh, as often the case. It becomes a major employment node. I think even university campus is there now. So. Um, the proximity to this this airport, which is now an international airport, is, is an important factor for the Tweed market as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, and taking that a step further, what we're finding is um, some of the top end of the market, uh, the purchases within those top ends of the markets, they may still have requirements in the capital cities. Um, what I mean by that is they may be a partner in the law firm or accounting firm, or they may be running a business. And having that proximity to the airport, either Coolangatta or Ballina Airport, which is Australia's busiest region, Ballina Airport being Australia's busiest regional airport, this allows people within travel time, or, you know, flight time, etc., they can be in one of the capital cities in uh, you know an hour and a half or two hours on the east coast. So. Um, although it may not look like it's connected and close by, it is a very easy, it's very easy to get around. Yeah. Now, we've talked a lot about the importance of infrastructure, and that's another thing that's happening in this area. Um, in particular, there's the, the prospect of a, a major new hospital, uh, a project that's costing over $500 million. It's been actually quite controversial in terms of the location of it, but nevertheless, important piece of infrastructure that's coming to that market is going to create a whole new major amenity for for the Tweed area, um, but also it's going to generate economic activity and jobs and bring new people in. Uh, <laughs> so firstly, to work on the construction, then to work on the completed project. So that's important as well for the Tweed area. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, uh, you, you know, if somebody has a, has a job within the public service, may that be the health or education, um, you know, the income is, is quite reasonable. If, if, if two parents are working, you know, um, as a nurse or, or, or a teacher along those lines, they still have the ability to live a really good quality life with an affordable house in that area. And so these, so once people cotton on to how, how good the quality of life is in these areas, um, you yeah, know, that's where, the, where we start to see the demand building up. 
Yeah. Now, one of the particular locations that I know you're interested in there is Kingscliff, and uh, it's it's uh, one that uh, we've, we've noted um, the median price for Kingscliff at, uh, for houses in the last 12 months has grown almost 20%. And so now it's a million dollar suburb. It's got a median house price above a million, but it's also a very, very strong um, apartment market, uh, much more affordable, median price around four thirty thousand. also showing good growth. So anything in particular about Kingscliff that's um, attracting your attention, Julian? Well, just off the back of those figures, um, Terry, uh, that's a, bit, a huge part of why we like the area. There is opportunity to, to buy below that median house price. Um, there's not a huge amount of opportunity to buy below that median house price, but um, we, we believe we've got our hands on some quality uh, properties in that location. Um, and we're expecting for ourselves and for our clients, for, for our ability to buy at below that median house price and just follow that median house price as it continues to grow over time. Yeah. Well, that's a great example of uh, one of the points that we're at pains to make, and I, I know you would agree with this, that um, you know, media are so obsessed with Sydney and Melbourne to, and, and they extrapolate that across the whole, co whole country and they're talking about you know, Australian property prices have been falling. They haven't been falling in this area. They've been getting remarkable growth. Uh, Kingscliff's median price up 20%. Cash Arena, which is very close to Kingscliff, up 21%. Then you've got Tweed Head South up 14%, and there's other locations in Twitch either have had double digit growth in their medium prices. This kind of growth is happening. People just know about these markets, but they're certainly not finding out about them from tapping into mainstream media, which continues to, to talk excessively about the two biggest cities. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that's the difference between an informed and educated investor versus somebody that wants to buy an A investment property in a location. The type of work that we do by uh, following these research methodologies, we're changing people's lives. So we're using numbers like 14%, 20%, you know, 30%, for example. But when you actually uh, overlay that figure on a purchase price from 500 to say 700,000, those types of figures really make a huge impact on somebody's life. Um, and so therefore, um, it's super important for investors to move away from the mainstream media, they could possibly be, be being fed fake news these days, Terry. I think that's a very strong possibility, particularly with the coverage of um, real estate in our, our major newspapers and uh, other uh, forms of media like ABC Radio and Television. Um, not particularly informed coverage at all. Um, quite often it's just a press release regurgitation, recycling of press releases, just a piece of propaganda from people with a vested interest in the method and the message that's contained in the press release. So I think investors need to, to do a little bit more than to uh, dig a little deeper um, and be um, able and willing to access good research information and good advice uh, from and get, you know, the assistance of companies like your own, Julian. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, uh, we're driven by results. So we're very, you know, there's nothing... There's no greater feeling um, both personally and professionally than having a client's portfolio grow, um, whether that be their first or subsequent properties, um, having them winning and having them continuously making money. It's a great feeling. It's a great business to be in if you can continue to deliver those results. Okay. Now, just um, um, we've been going about 40 minutes. Um, the time we have available... Um, which we want to um, leave some time for to answer people's questions. So I'll just remind people that you can um, type your questions into the Q&A panel in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. But just to switch attention one more time, Julian, we've talked about an important regional city in Queensland. We've talked about a growth area in New South Wales. So let's focus on regional Victoria. Um, I know you're particularly interested in that market, as are we. We've found it to be one of the very strongest market jurisdictions um, anywhere in Australia over the last couple of years and continues to be strong. Um, and um, one of those uh, markets that has been a very good performer um, is the city of Ballarat, not far from the city of Melbourne, uh, very well connected to Melbourne, a strong, diverse growth city in its own right. So tell us a little bit about your interest in, in that particular location, Julian. 
Oh, Ballarat presents an excellent opportunity based on the um, infrastructure that's being spent in there. But the entry price to Ballarat is one that a lot of people can afford. So not everybody can afford the Kingscliff market, for example. Um, we spoke about Noosa. Again, not, you know, those types of markets aren't for everybody. However, Ballarat at its entry level point, which we believe uh, the buying should be sub 500 in, in Ballarat, um, it, it, it presents such a great opportunity for people in that price range. Um, and as Geelong's now progressing further and further through its cycle, um, people can still make uh, good gains, sub 500 in Ballarat. I'm, I'm just looking at um, a chart of uh, suburbs in Ballarat. Um, a lot of suburbs have median prices for houses in the 300,000. There's, there's some in the low mid 400,000, but the most popular suburb in terms of the number of sales in the last 12 months is Sebastopol, um, 270 um, house sales in the last 12 months, median price 285,000. Um, so still very affordable, despite the fact that um, the median price has grown 10% in the last 12 months. And that's a, the big standout from this list, uh, Julian, is that virtually every suburb uh, in Ballarat has had double digit growth in its median price in the last 12 months. And we know that that's been going on for the last couple of years and it's still happening. Yeah, um, again, uh, numbers, research, data is extremely important. Without getting uh, down to the ground level, spending the time being face to face with the market, um, you know, there's more to it than the, the data is definitely promising. Um, and however, what we find is the data is the very first stage of the process. Um, we spend a lot of time in the office um, looking at these figures uh, before we actually get down to the ground level. And once we get down to the ground level, um, we can then determine, okay, is you know, is this a sugar hit or is this the beginning of a consistent growth? Um, and so Ballarat uh, was was somewhere that we did spend time uh, being face to face with the market and and absolutely supporting what you said there, Terry. Uh, great gains at a great entry level price, and that's what attracts us to the area and its proximity to Melbourne, obviously. Yeah, I think one of the things that's helping to drive that market and others that are say within an hour or so of metropolitan Melbourne is actually buyers out of Melbourne, both home buyers and uh, investors. Um, Melbourne had sort of four years of strong growth and has become an expensive market. People are looking for more affordable alternatives and they're finding it in regional cities like Ballarat, also perhaps a different lifestyle. Um, in some cases, people might choose to buy and live in Ballarat and actually commute back to Melbourne and work because it is within commuting distance, great train links and good road links as well. Absolutely. And that definitely, um, all, all of those things add to the appeal of Ballarat. You know, some of the things that we noticed during our research is if you're sort of 30 minutes out of uh, Melbourne and it doesn't really matter which way outside of Melbourne that you go, um, you know, 30 or 45 minutes out of Melbourne, those areas are congested, the block sizes are small, uh, by comparison, the purchase prices are probably anywhere from $150,000 to $200,000 more. But what we found was um, we were quite surprised of the negative quality of life in those locations. So, um, yeah, Geelong, Ballarat, those locations just past those 45 minute places or 35 minute places out of Melbourne. They bring so much. Ballarat is a beautiful city. Um, the architecture in town is, 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 is very, um, very appealing. It's easy on the eye. And uh, we, yeah, what we, could, we just couldn't see um, how the quality of life on the outskirts of Melbourne in these huge estates where there seems to be no uh, no end in sight for their ability to continue to bring um, paddocks of land to, to the market. Yeah, it, was, it just seemed to be a no-brainer to go for Ballarat versus the outskirts of Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 
the, it does tick so many boxes. Uh, you mentioned the, the architecture, and it's a historic city, you know, going back perhaps to the Gold Rush day. So it's got a lot of big, grand, old historic buildings. So it's got that lovely fabric to it, as well as all the modern amenities, great infrastructure. So population of over 100,000 projected to keep growing. It's got lots of different elements to its economy. Um, there's lots being spent on infrastructure. We keep hammering that point, but um, Ballarat's got, for example, $460 million being spent on a hospital upgrade. There are a couple of very major wind farm projects, um, a couple of billion dollar projects, in fact, just outside of Ballarat. That's going to bring economic activity. Um, you, could, you could talk about just about Ballarat for, for a couple of hours because it's got so many qualities. And then you've got the affordability factor and the better rental yields compared to Melbourne just down the road. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly right, uh, Terry. Um, yeah, again, infrastructure, a really key point, and I think that's coming through with a lot of the discussions that we've had in this webinar, is the infrastructure. The other thing is what we've found, and I'm not trying to get political one way or the other, is the Victorian government has really done a great job in making these uh, regional cities more accessible to Melbourne. So for example, um, you know, train lines are being uh, more direct to the, to, from Ballarat into Melbourne City. Geelong from Port Arlington, for example, there's additional um, ferries that will commute workers within an hour and 30 minutes uh, from Port Arlington, for example, all the way into, into the city. And it's the same into Docklands and it's the same with Ballarat. Can jump on a train and still be in, in Melbourne, kind of in that one and one to one and a half hours. So yeah. a lot of people closer to Melbourne, their commute would be equally as long, um, and their ha and the, the real estate would would not be comparable. It'd be so much more expensive, therefore more mortgage stress and things like that. So we see a huge amount of upside for the lifestyle and the demand for property in Ballarat. But actually, um, it's a good. A point well made, the state government actually spent $5 billion on what they called the regional rail link. And the idea there was uh, the trains coming in from locations like Geelong, Ballarat, and also Bendigo, which also is a place with lots of qualities as well, ended up being stuck behind suburban trains. So they built a dedicated um, train line, that what they called the regional rail link, $5 billion project that was completed a couple of years ago and up and running. So people coming in from places like Ballarat can get there much faster and in greater comfort. So that's been a big factor. I think the other thing um, that's worth mentioning about um, Victoria generally, uh, the reason why these markets are doing so well is Victoria is uh, ranked the number one state economically in the country. It's also the number one state by some margin for population growth. It just keeps topping the charts, whichever uh, kind of um, economic indicator you care to mention, but particularly, um, the performance of the economy, spending on infrastructure is a big part of it, and population growth. Look, Melbourne, besides the weather, Melbourne has a lot to offer. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit more partial to, to warmer weather, and, uh, you know, I've, I've moved north from Canberra. I would, you know, eventually I may be on the Sunshine Coast, further north where it's warmer. However, um, yeah, look, Melbourne's definitely in a position to grow. Uh, if you if you consider how flat Melbourne is in comparison to, for example, Sydney, um, there there's a lot of land that's readily, uh, easily and readily being able to be brought to the market. So um, when it comes to investing and in, in, <clears throat> and real estate, uh, you need to break down those figures. Sure, Melbourne will be big. Uh, sure, that will have some powerful ec economic um, uh, impacts for jobs and real estate, but you also have to be very aware that there is there is paddock upon paddock upon paddock, flat paddocks surrounding uh, the Melbourne uh, metro area. So you have to do your homework and make sure you're not going to be end up in an area where the supply will continue on for you know, 20 or 30 years, therefore putting downward pressure on your property price. Yeah. And we actually saw that, Julie, in, um, in the Wyndham Vale area, which is uh, heading down in the south, uh, southwest, uh, we're out, yeah. out of central Melbourne, um, suburbs like Werribee and um, Wyndham Vale, uh, Point Cook, um, newer suburbs like Tarnit. Um, it went for a phase of uh, major oversupply perhaps half a dozen years ago, which dragged down property values. It's 
since absorbed all of that and it's been a growth market. But um, those sorts of um, things, as you point out, there's just so much land available for, for new suburbs, whole new suburbs, in fact, in those areas. And you're just going to be very, very mindful of the level of supply and the level of vacancy rates. Yeah, and look, you make a good point that those property markets have changed over time. Um, as a company and personally as an investor, an uh, active investor, um, I, I, I would like my assets to be bought at the right time of the cycle because the whole concept of an asset is it's there to support you and it's there to grow. So buying in these areas, sure, um, you, 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 know, uh, you can hang in there uh, and wait for those markets to turn around. For me personally, they present far too much risk. I would be much, I'd much rather uh, follow the data and um, be contrarian as, uh, in terms of capital city locations to make sure my assets are going to be able to support me when I need them, uh, not, not having to wait for them to do their job in three or four years' time. Okay. Well, James, um, we're, we've got about uh, five minutes to go before the, the hour is up. Um, perhaps we could... Um, Someone's uh, reacting to your, your comment about the, the Melbourne weather. Fair enough, I was down there last weekend. It was pretty damn cold, let me tell you, but a great place to be nevertheless. Um, perhaps we could focus on some of the questions that are coming in. Timothy's um, asking about a reference you made when we're talking about the Sunshine Coast, Julian, uh, that you invested heavily in that area in 2015 and just uh, asking perhaps you could expand on what you mean by that, what, what, um, who was actually investing there um, at that time. Okay, so so Timothy can hear us, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So so Tim, uh, Timothy, what we what that means is um, we, uh, as a location at that point in time, um, you know, we focused all of our attention on making sure, making sure our investors got good deals in those locations. So in 2015, 14, uh, anywhere close to Maroochydore, we believe that was the place that we were going to get our clients' deposits back within that two years. Sometimes they were even faster. Um, whereas now we have a, we, our, um, our approach and our locations, as you heard in the, in the, in the webinar, are, um, there's, more, uh, there's more variety there um, because we, we, we really nailed that early growth for our investors. And so now you need to be a little bit you need to work a little bit harder for that same type of growth. So I'm not sure, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So as essentially, you, you pinpointed the Sunshine Coast a couple of years ago, um, rather well timed, I would have to say, ahead of the growth that's happened since then. But you pinpointed as a location that you were recommending to your investor clients that, and you helped them to buy on the Sunshine Coast as a result of that a couple of years ago. Yeah, so and, um, at that point in time, you know, there were other companies promoting areas in, in that location. Um, the location that, that the majority of our clients purchased in, there was extremely limited land supply. It, it, it basically shared a border where the new CBD was being purchased. So for us, it provided everything. Um, or it ticked a lot of boxes. You know, it was unique. The, the type of housing was unique, um, it was high quality. So yeah, but you know, people that, other people that have purchased in Sunshine Coast at that same time frame, if they were in the wrong locations where there was too much land to support, too much land supply, they, they probably weren't gonna, they probably didn't get the results that we got in that, in that time frame. Jen, Avi's asking about Mumbai, which is um, on the Sunshine Coast and what we, uh, we think about. Um, yeah, Mumbai versus Moreton Bay region. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Terry, you go. No, no. Um, if, if you've got uh, some thoughts on, about, on on that particular question, go for your life. Yeah, look, Moreton Bay for me, um, I'm assuming you're meaning north of Brisbane when you're talking about the Moreton Bay region. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, you have to be, again, you have to be very careful. There's some corridors of land in between, um, in between south, Sunshine Coast and North Brisbane. Um, and if you're in a location where there is a lot of land supply, you need to be very careful um, about what you buy and where you buy. Uh, Wombai is 
I, where would I buy if I had a choice between Moreton Bay and Wombai? I would probably buy in Wombai. Um, but then again, if you're going to invest in the Sunshine Coast, I believe there's better places within the Sunshine Coast to purchase rather than Wombai. At this stage, RV, I have no idea what your budget is. I'm just telling you uh, as much as I can from the information you've given me. Yeah, I tend to agree with that, Julian. I think Wombo is kind of more of a sort of an acreage lifestyle kind of a place. And I think you'd be directing your clients more down to central Sunshine Coast where the, the infrastructure is uh, closer to the beaches, closer to you know, all, all the sort of um, the basic infrastructure, shopping, etc., that um, the Sunshine Coast has to offer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, um, Gail is asking, do you have an ex we mentioned, you mentioned, uh, use the term sugar hit. You're trying to avoid those locations where sometimes there's growth and you've got to ask the question, is it just a sugar hit or is it, is it real and long term? And she's asking, would you have some examples of places that are more sugar hit type uh, places that, rather than the places that have the stronger fundamentals? Yeah, look, at a high level, Gail, um, a sugar hit uh, location uh, would be what we saw within the mining industry. Um, yeah. There was there was really only uh, one uh, economic driver to the growth in that location. It relied heavily on one on one part of the economy, and so therefore it, it presents more risks. The areas that Terry and I are talking about are diverse economies. They have both public uh, and government infrastructure spending. Um, uh, they have appeal for quality of, of lifestyle. So if you compare those to mining areas, you know some of those mining areas um, were, were, you know, definitely boomed and they and they went. But outside of the outside of the mining boom, it's highly unlikely anybody would go to live there for the lifestyle. And without any jobs, then obviously that was the recipe for disaster to see places go down. So there are there are a couple of areas out there um, that are considered sugar hits. We're happy to take that conversation offline if you like. Yeah, um, and right now, unfortunately, uh, Julian, we're starting to see um, headlines in major newspapers suggesting um, some some of the mining towns are going to have booms because of the approvals for the Adani coal project in Queensland. And I'm very much at pains to warn people that. I don't think that that's very wise investment for the reasons you've just articulated. My girl is also asking about Queenbeyan. Now, Queenbeyan is just outside of Canberra. It's an area that we uh, we have focused a little bit um, on as well. Do do you have that on your radar screen, Julian? Yeah, Queen. I'm a Canberra boy, um, uh, born and born and raised in Canberra. Um, so I understand the Queenbeyan market. It does again. It, once again, it's it's uh, it's affordable. The thing about parts of Queenbeyan is the, the entry level prices are a lot lower than the surrounding Canberra suburbs. So, um, the, and, 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 so as prices become more expensive in Canberra, um, people are looking for, uh, looking for alternatives and Queenbeyan really uh, can absorb that part of the market. So yeah, however, in saying that um, we aren't, uh, we're not heavily, Focusing on that on that region at the moment. That's not an area that, that's on our um, radar. But I'm sure Terry can add a lot because I know Terry's been um, been researching that area for a while. Yeah, um, similar to what you've said, uh, Julian. Um, it's it's proximity to Canberra, but more affordable than Canberra, and also um, because it's over the invisible border in New South Wales. Um, first home buyers have been able to drive over that invisible border. Uh, effectively be buying, you're only 15 minutes from the centre of Canberra. I actually drove it um, earlier this year just to convince myself it was that close. Um, so you're 15 minutes from the centre of Canberra. You actually in New South Wales, you can access first home buyer benefits that are available in New South Wales and buy more affordably than you can in many of the suburbs of Canberra, but being closer to the centre of Canberra than many of the suburbs of the ACT. Um, another question. Huge, huge here, price range, huge price difference. Yeah. For that 15 minutes, massive price difference. Yeah, so it's definitely worth considering. Um, Nish is asking, what are your thoughts on um, Western Newcastle market? So Newcastle is probably worth a, a bit of a comment, Julian, but uh, Nish is particularly asking about Western uh, Newcastle markets like Thornton. 
Yes, so, uh, look, um, Thornton is not an area I've been closely looking at. Um, but what I would say is um, a lot of companies that don't put a lot of effort and time into actual research that's going to result in, um, in, in, in getting your deposit back in, those, in that, uh, you know, two years or less. Uh, there's a lot of building going on in Thornton. Uh, there seems to be a lot of land there. Um, can you make money there over time? Absolutely. Um, however, it could be a case where um, you buy now and you may have to wait several years until you're, you're able to get, uh, to get your deposit back. They're probably, in my experience with areas like that, you're probably not going to get valuation support from the banks. Um, they seem to not like areas like Thornton uh, off the back of supply issues and things like that. Okay. All right. Look, uh, Julian, we're, we've clicked over the hour, about an hour and five minutes. In fact, we've been going, um, and I think we've, uh, we've covered a lot of useful territory for people who are watching and listening. Um, so thank you, everyone, who has participated today. I know that... Um, Many people are registered for the event and will watch a recording later. Everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive a copy via email and can um, watch it again or for the first time at your leisure. Um, we just want to um, put up um, a slide, um, Katie, if you can make that happen, um, to show people how they can um, make contact with um, Julian and his business if they'd like to follow up and um, ask further questions or perhaps um, talk to Julian and his team about how they can assist them as, as property investors to um, to invest in the right places. Um, Katie, it was there and then it's got here, it's back there. So um, Julian, perhaps you could just uh, speak to that for a few moments before we wrap up. Yeah, so this is us, this is our company. Um, we, we are uh, we're focused on results, okay? We are not a, we're not an undercover property marketing agency uh, with close ties to developers that are just pushing product that can't be sold in the, um, <clears throat> in the local region. You know, I think uh, if I can, uh, whilst I have this time here, just point out you know, there's a lot of companies that look and sound similar, but um, if if the company has uh, a, a huge amount of property to present to you or sell to you, um, I'd be concerned about that. We're very specific about where we invest. There's um, there's always demand in the locations that we invest, so our, our investors need to move quickly, uh, and we have a very strong um, we have a very strong uh, history of, of great results. So get in touch with us uh, and we'd be more than happy to share those results with you. Um, and obviously being uh, mutual clients of Terry's, uh, we have, we're not precious with the time. So please, any question that you have, we'll be more than happy to help you. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Julian. And thanks for your participation today. I think it's been a, a great broadcast. I think we've, um, we've touched on... Um, not only some great areas that I think are really useful for people to consider the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, uh, the Tweed Shire area in New South Wales, and in regional Victoria, firstly Geelong is a great example of uh, recent growth, and Ballarat is a great example of current growth markets. Um, but we've also touched on some, some very useful issues, the importance of infrastructure, the importance of investing in places that have diverse economies and growth factors, the importance of being aware of uh, supply issues. Um, some areas have lots of land available for new development and that can suppress uh, property growth. So we've um, not only touched on great locations, but also very important issues for people to be aware of. Um, if, I can, if I can just add, sorry to cut you off, Terry. Can I just add two things? Um, we don't give away all of our secrets. So we do, we do still have some areas that we haven't spoken about today. Um, that are equally as impressive. The second thing is we are a major sponsor of the West Tigers football team. They are playing Cronulla this Sunday. And if they win, it will be the first time in nine years that they reach the semi-finals or the finals. So 
Um, if you can, get out there, support the West Tigers. It's going to be a great game. Sorry, Terry, I had to take it away from business there, but it's big news here in Sydney. Yes, there, 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 is, there is life beyond real estate, Julian. That's, and, um, that's right. And, and the fourth Ashes test starts tonight. I'm going to be tuning into that as well. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot, Jim. I think it's been great. Really interesting to talk to you in this format. It's great to have this sort of conversation. I think it's useful for people out there watching and listening to to hear what you think and what I think and to toss these issues around and talk about locations. If you want to follow up and find out more of what uh, Property360 and June Fedini and his team can offer, the, uh, the um, contact details are on the screen. Um, but um, no, please take advantage of that opportunity. So thanks for participating and um, let's do it again soon. Bye for now. Perfect. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Terry. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Cheers. Bye. Okay. See you, Julie.